Hello and welcome to our last live stream of Iowa Archaeology Month. I'm Elizabeth Reitz with the Office of the State Archaeologist and John Dorschek, our state archaeologist, is joining us for an ongoing Q&A. So there's no presentation or lecture this time. Um, oh, that's the wrong banner, but also join the Iowa Archaeological Society as well. Um, as always, if you have a question, put it into the comments on either Facebook or YouTube because we can see them both. And um, I'll kick it off with some questions, but uh, John, do you wanna say anything else or should we, I mean, you're gonna introduce yourself in, in my questions that I've got prepped, so. Yep, just thanks for having me, this will be fun. Yeah, so to start us off, um, can you give us a brief elevator speech of what OSA does and about OSA? Okay, that'll be tricky because I usually give 45 minute tours of the building, so I'll have to, I'll have to pare that down, but. Uh, in a nutshell, we're a research center at the University of Iowa. We were placed here intentionally in 1959 through a cooperative effort by the then university president and the governor. Um, uh, we're currently about 22 full-time staff members strong. Uh, we have a number of mandated activities by the Iowa Code uh, that keep a lot of us busy. Uh, plus, we do lots of Iowa-based contract and grant um, research. Um, want me to keep going or do you want to fine tune that? <laughs> no, we'll just, we'll keep asking questions about, so you, cause you've been doing archeology span for quite a while now. So, but you are currently our state archeologist. So what does a state archeologist do? Okay. Uh, it really depends which state you're in. Uh, some states it's as simple as being the designated review archaeologist at the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, which means you are inundated with contract archaeology reports that you have to very quickly process and comment on, and that's all you ever get to do. Uh, we're fortunate in Iowa that that function is uh, separate from the Office of the State Archaeologist function. Uh, at least I'm lucky. Uh, my colleagues over at uh, the State Historic Preservation Office have to do their work. but. Uh, uh, as state archaeologist in Iowa, I'm able to act as an interested party to the uh, compliance required archaeological uh, activities that go on in the state that SHPO has the review and comment authority on. Uh, so I can provide expert assistance and uh, back them up on some of their decisions and requests and requirements. Uh, so that's a very powerful sort of, uh, of uh, twofold role here that we have in Iowa. Other states, it's more complex. It's, it's the state archaeologists are based in all manner of state government settings, from universities to DNRs to Department of Cultural Affairs, like here in Iowa, or uh, like Shippo is here, um, departments of administration, uh, even economic development in some states. So those uh, settings put a lot of constraints on what a state archaeologist can do. But the idea is that um, state archaeologists provide uh, the public, especially but then other archaeologists uh, with information, I think, is the nutshell. Um, speaking of information, we do have one quick question, hmm. and I know that you get asked this all the time, um, but what should we do if we find an arrowhead in the yeah, world? That, that, is, that is the basic question right there, so I'm, I'm glad somebody asked it. Uh, I do get this uh, pretty much every day, uh, uh, at least every working day. Um, and the wonderful thing about email is that people can attach high, high resolution photographs. Uh, and if they don't, I can prompt them to do so. So in the old days, people used to have to find an archaeologist physically to show them something that they've discovered. And now we can do it all digitally, of course. So discovery of uh, an arrowhead or a, 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 let's broaden it to artifact of some sort uh, often is what drives public communication with the office. So. Uh, I try to take all those very seriously and uh, give them give them some time to uh, in my schedule to address. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, online, um, a very powerful geographic information system database. So when someone says I found this at place X, I can zoom in very quickly on maps on my desktop and get a feel for uh, what the local landscape is like. Plus all our recorded information is there available for me. So I can compare and say, oh, this person found something where someone else had reported finding something, in which case we have a replication of a known site location. Um, or maybe it's a brand new find and we've never had any information from that spot, which is also very, ex uh, also uh, always very exciting to be able to get new information. So I try to work with people and, and determine first and foremost uh, 
what the age of an object might be and what the context of their discovery was. Was it something uh, uh, in this example in the woods, but was it actually in a in a eroded stream gully or was it uh, on the surface? Um, was it in a plowed field? All these things condition, of course, what we can say about an object from the past. So we start to put together the story of, of what it is. And uh, I try to help them uh, record new information wherever possible. If the context is good and, and we have enough detail, then, then it's a, a good addition to the, the uh, statewide database that we maintain, which currently has about 30,000 sites in it. And we'd love to see it have 60,000 sites. The more locations we can get, the better. So if someone finds something, short answer is contact the office, send us a good photograph, send us a description of, of where it was found and uh, we'll work with you to get that recorded. And I guess this would be a good spot, uh, Elizabeth, to, to dispel the, the myth that, that seems to dog us every step of the way in our existence is that um, I do not have the power to take artifacts from anyone. So uh, don't hesitate to contact the office with your discoveries. If you have come about them legally, then uh, that's uh, you know your business and between you and wherever you found them, uh, we're interested in the information and that's what we're trying to report. Right, and we'd love to work with the public to, uh, to teach them how to properly catalog their finds, maybe even store them so they can keep them. Of course, we don't have uh, infinite space here at right. the office. Uh, so I did drop a link in the comments about how to record an archaeological site. And I'll just point out quick that if you're on public lands, no matter local, county, state, or federal, um, you cannot collect artifacts from public lands. But if you find something, you can take a picture and record the location and, and let us know. Um, so what's your day job like as the Iowa State Archaeologist? It is uh, variable, I guess I would say. It's rare that I get to do the same thing for more than an hour, it seems like, let alone a day. So, so most of my days are a mishmash of uh, communicating across the various programs that we have here at the office. And I guess I'll loop back on the, the earlier question about our structure. Those 22 employees that I talked about are, are split into uh, several different segments. One of our responsibilities is to be the state archaeological repository. So this includes artifacts, but also associated documentation, maps and photographs and figures and whatnot. So we have a very, very large digital um, archive, a smaller print archive. We've been trying to get rid of print and go digital um, about Iowa archaeology and Iowa archaeological sites. And then we have uh, the material records, the artifacts from uh, approximately 11,000 sites across the state, uh, many of which are not extant anymore. The only thing that's left of them are these records that are in the repository, either the artifacts or the associated materials. So the State Archaeological Repository is a, is, a, is a big function of the office, and we deal both with the discoveries that we make, uh, but also those that are made by uh, uh, professional archaeological consultants across the state and region, uh, as well as on occasion, private donations that are documented well enough to have research value. We can sometimes accept those into the State Archaeological Repository. Uh, we also maintain the Iowa site file, which is this record of 30,000 archaeological sites that I was talking about. So there's often issues about site recordation uh, and then the use of that database uh, for uh, review and compliance type activities. Uh, we maintain on behalf of the State Historic Preservation Office uh, a layer in that online database of all recorded um, previously investigated areas. Uh, so not just sites, but where people have looked for sites, at least using professional techniques. So that's an important role. Uh, so I'm often interfacing with the site record manager and, the, and our research technology director about the Iowa site file. Um, uh, another big area that we are uh, charged uh, uh, as responsible for by the state is the uh, um, laws protecting ancient human remains in Iowa. Uh, and we could talk at some length about those, but uh, uh, in short, uh, we are charged with preserving and protecting remains that are greater than 150 years in age. Uh, and that's one of those things that uh, ebbs and flows, but nearly every week there's an issue about that that needs some attention. And I work with my uh, bioarchaeology director and, and uh, her assistant to work on those kinds of issues. Uh, once those things are uh, sort of taken care of on any given day, then there are research interests as well. The, uh, the bulk of the staff work on externally funded contracts and grants. And I'm often uh, participating in discussions about scopes of work and budget details and administrative details dealing with the university in terms of running the research enterprise here at the, at the university. And then I do get to do a little bit of my own research once in a while. So I try to do, try to squeeze that in too. Um, yeah. And, and on that note, so you have been at 
at OSA since 1995, mm -hmm. but started in archaeology before then. So before you became state archaeologist, what was your uh, big research interest? Ah, okay. Um, all the way back as an undergraduate, I started getting interested in the spatial relationships of artifacts. Uh, time, space, and form are the big three kind of uh, research spheres in archaeology that, that people might be familiar with, how old something is, where it's located, what form it takes. Um, I, always, I always gravitated towards the spatial aspect, and maybe that's the way my brain's wired or something, but I was always interested about associations between things, stratigraphic relationships in archaeological sites, what's deeper, what's not. Uh, so those uh, uh, interests led me to uh, do some um, predictive modeling kind of work as an undergraduate, but then when I got to Northwestern and started to uh, get a feel for what was there to work with, uh, that was at the he heels of all the field work for the Coster site having been completed. Coster is a very uh, deeply buried, stratified, large uh, site in the lower Illinois River Valley that uh, has stacked horizons, very nicely separated by sterile zones of one archaic layer after another. So it's a really great time capsule in one spot to compare uh, and hold constant the environmental variables while looking at the uh, change through time in the cultural material. Uh, so uh, folks before me had worked on dissertations involving the stone tools and the, um, and the animal bone and uh, you know pretty much every category of, of archeological material, but no one had looked at it in terms of patterning. And so I got into building a big database to look at uh, the patterns and did a big spatial analysis of the archaic uh, settlements there at Coster. So, so coming out of grad school, that was sort of my um, my forte, so to speak. But I had also done some contract archaeology along the way to pay the bills. And uh, despite my efforts to get into a tenured faculty line someplace, um, that didn't happen uh, early on. And I quickly abandoned that because I got a good job in cultural resource management archaeology for a private consulting firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I spent five years there as a principal investigator and that was fantastic experience. Uh, I, I like to look at it as sort of a postdoc in CRM uh, in, in so far as uh, I got stuff thrown at me from New York to Louisiana and everywhere in between, uh, all kinds of time periods, all kinds of materials, all kinds of problems to solve. Uh, so I really learned a lot about um, the cultural resource management archaeology world which then I carried over here to OSA when I came in in 1995. That's what I was hired to do. And um, uh, then I started uh, uh, tacking on to uh, Bill Green as a mentor and learning how to become a state archeologist. So then I was able to do years. <laughs> so we're gonna, we'll, we'll circle back to your research interests, but there's a question that came in first, kind of a, kind of a curveball. Uh, I know that we've had a presentation about this at OSA, but we don't do this, but can you talk about the use of detection dogs? What are they used for? How often are they used? Um, and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've, we've just in the last couple of years been exposed to that ourselves. And we, I guess to be honest, we're still in sort of the, 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 the trial period for that. Um, more and more data seems to be accruing that dogs really are good at detecting all kinds of things, uh, including potentially ancient human remains. Uh, we know for a fact that they are very good at finding recent uh, deceased individuals and many disaster scenarios from building collapse or, or, or war zone or whatever kinds of things where there are individuals uh, who have been killed recently. They're very, very useful and also finding living survivors too, for that matter. Uh, but a big question mark is how far or how old can remains be and dogs still detect them? And uh, we've worked with a, a handler here in Iowa that uh, we've visited with him a couple of times here in Iowa City. He's brought us dogs and we've seen them in action. Plus, we've worked um, with him in the field on a couple of projects. We've been aware of him working with other archaeologists. And there seems to be pretty good results. Um, in terms of expense, I don't know what he's charging to do work. Uh, when he's worked with us, it's all been pro bono stuff where, where because you know we're trying to establish whether it's working well or not. Um, sometimes these things, uh, you know, you have to be very careful about double blind testing of this kind of, of activity. Uh, taking a dog out to a known burial mound that's obvious on the landscape to both the human handler and the dog is not a particularly robust test uh, if they start 
signaling that they, you know, doing their signal that they have found ancient human remains. Well, the, the, the human knows they're there. The dog may be able to even tell um, from the physical landscape that something's different. Uh, so until there are some really rigorous double blind tests that are repetitive, um, it's going to be hard to say that they're absolutely this percentage reliable of that. But, but in general, I think it's a useful tool, kind of right up there with geophysical testing, which oftentimes will show an anomaly under the ground surface, but you don't know what it is. So um, it still takes some checking sometimes, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So we'll just keep going in order. Circle back. So what are your research interests now at this time? Well, uh, too when you broad. get to do research, <laughs> uh, too broad. And and since Mary asked, uh, you know, the whole use of drones in archaeology is is fascinating. It kind of goes back to the spatial aspect of what I'm interested in. Um, Mary in our office is 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 using uh, photogrammetry, and we're talking about maybe getting a lidar unit for a drone. Although that's a uh, big money that we're talking about there. But man, what kind of cool data could you get with that? And uh, uh, looking at broad patterns uh, from up high and across the, the landscape, um, but I'm 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 equally interested in the um, the pottery that we're getting, for example, from a from a site that we have done some salvage work on out in Northwest Iowa, 13 p.m. seven, and this site uh, was severely impacted by uh, river flooding a couple of years ago, and we we were able to get up there and we recovered all kinds of cool Mill Creek artifacts, including a huge ceramic assemblage, some of which has uh, uh, pieces of pottery that are clear copies of what was being made at Cahokia at the time. They're locally made, but uh, they're of the same design motifs. So how does that happen? What, what goes on to, what was the communication between these uh, societies that are separated by you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles? So, um, so that kind of stuff is interesting. Um, I got to be involved with the research at Fort Madison uh, for a couple of years. And uh, I still remain very interested in more of 1812 stuff because of that. So unfortunately, the longer I'm an archaeologist, the greater my interest. <laughs> so it's hard to it's hard to focus sometimes. Like right, as you mentioned with cultural resource management, we kind of have to be experts at what's thrown in our face at that time. And and so yeah. But there's really cool things that that come up and then oh, of course always. you get really interested in it. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a pretty important question. So what are some opportunities for avocationalists to be involved with OSA beyond reporting a find? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we do have a close relationship. The OSA has a close relationship with the Iowa Archaeological Society. And uh, that is the, um, my first recommendation would be to join the IAS because it's the group in Iowa of avocationalists who are dedicated to site preservation and learning about the past. Uh, going that next step beyond artifact collection, which is a, a driver for many people about uh, being passionate about the past is the objects. But there's so much more than the objects. Uh, we, we really try to stress that with people that the objects are the entryway, but the stories behind them all have to do with context and association uh, provenience. And, and, and to understand those things, you have to know more about archaeology and not just about artifacts. So, um, what we would what what we try to do is encourage the IAS and support them as we're able to uh, engage in some opportunities for avocationists. And we were all set this fall to have a, a really interesting program out at White Rock Conservancy in Western Iowa, but the decision was made that COVID is still raging to the point where that's not a good idea. But hopefully by next spring or maybe worst case next fall, uh, that program can go on. And uh, we're trying to get some grant money right now. Elizabeth and I were talking just this morning. There's a new grant opportunity that's just been announced at the federal level that might be appropriate for us to inject funds into our um, uh, uh, IAS programs that have to do with getting people certified to be site surveyors and recorders and uh, stewards as well. So we can start getting more opportunities for uh, people across the state to get involved in discovery and reporting of archaeological sites in a systematic way, and uh, also monitoring what's happening to some of these important places out there. Yeah, and along with that grant, there are, uh, we know that there are lots of private personal collections out there, mm -hmm. and we'd love to workshop with people so they can learn more about what they have and catalog things properly, and eventually share that information with us. But um, we just, yeah, we're definitely brainstorming ways to be of more service to greater Iowa and to um, just facilitate more information sharing. So a follow-up question from Matt. 
Um, are there any substantial pre-1800 sites other than Iowaville that show interactions between trappers and indigenous people? Uh, we, we definitely would have to dip into the records a little bit. And this is the kind of question that we often throw out on our internal email list uh, when they come in just to see what different people know and, and have in the back of their minds based on their experiences. But I would say broadly, yes, they are out there. Uh, and um, if there's any archaeologists who are listening in and they want to throw a uh, suggestion onto the chat. Well, there are, you know, blood run. There is not the right. actual interaction, but there's interaction of trade goods. And the same yes. with trade, the Okaboji region. Gillette yeah, exactly. Road. Trade goods are something that has greater time death than the actual interactions between, let's say, the trappers and the indigenous people. That's a that's not quite a moment in time, but it might be a decade or two decades or a generation in time. That's a little bit harder to see archaeologically. But um, some of the places Elizabeth mentioned in Northwest Iowa and also up, uh, in other parts of Iowa, uh, where there are trade goods, are, are good signature that at least native peoples were becoming aware of non-native peoples and the material good differences between the cultures. And what's really cool is on some of these sites where you get native peoples reimagining how to use a raw material like a piece of scrap metal off of a bucket gets turned into a piece of jewelry or a tinkler cone or a cutting tool or a bead gets melted down and not used just as a glass bead but as a as a raw material to create some other kind of uh, decorative object so that's kind of cool uh, so those those do exist uh, there is that time horizon from about 1680 uh, up to about 1800 where it was still an indigenous world here in Iowa but there were more and more trade goods filtering in and then eventually non-native peoples making direct contact. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, but again, archeological visibility of that is, is tricky. What about the Dubuque area, Mines of Spain? Well, the lead mining in the Dubuque area was uh, certainly uh, a place where there was substantial native uh, activity in that area. And being right on the Mississippi, of course, it's an area where uh, non-native traffic was pretty heavy early on. so. So uh, in that area, the Mines of Spain area is, is another good example of that. Okay. Yeah. And the, the archaeologists watching are not throwing us a bone with that one. Okay, so. I'm not going not gonna to make any suggestions. Um, so <laughs> Cherie, who is running the Iowa Archaeological Field School, is reminding us that it is, um, it's going to be happening in May. So I am just putting the, the link in for um, you to go look at the details about that. And I haven't reconfigured the the purchasing of slots. So it's a $10 contribution a day, which covers some of the incidentals, but otherwise free. Um, and Maria says just south of Francisville in Missouri is a, a site that Matt might be interested in. Huh. So uh, I'll go back to my list of questions. Um, what do you find most challenging about a career in archeology? span well, uh, it's it's never been a great job market. Um, there there aren't very many professional archaeologists in the world, actually. Um, but it's not impossible. But it's not impossible. So if you, if you have a, a real interest in it, you, you can make a living doing it. But uh, there are also probably easier paths in life too, as well, uh, to to make a living. But uh, so one of the one of the frustrations is just I, I meet a lot of students who have a real passion an interest in the past, but they don't really know what they want to do. And I, and I try to be a good mentor in as much as I, I try to be real. I try to, to say, this is, this is the lay of the land that you're, that you're looking at getting into. So, you know, really work on refining your uh, interests, uh, focus and make connections right as early as possible and start building a community of, of like-minded uh, archaeologists that you'll be working with because that increases your potential for getting into programs, getting jobs, uh, moving up in the world in terms of making a living. That so, so that's one of, that's one challenge. The the bigger challenge though is really the frustration with our greater society. We have clearly a concern in modern America for the past. Um, some people are are very passionate about it, uh, but it doesn't get expressed in the funding streams that uh, uh, support preservation activities and stewardship and caring for that past archaeological record. Uh, there's, it's a very casual system in many ways, and that becomes very, very frustrating when no federal agency is there to step up to be responsible, for example, at the federal level for some kind of action or 
uh, a project that's going on that's going to disturb huge amounts of landscape and take out a lot of archaeology. Uh, in Iowa, we do not have a strong state level uh, preservation law program. The, the ancient burial, protection of ancient burials is great. We were the first in the country with that, which is admirable, uh, but it could be a lot stronger in terms of just consideration of potentially significant places before they get destroyed. And that, that unfortunately is a pretty loose net. So, uh, so all that um, uh, frustration with uh, there just not being a way to say to someone, slow down, let's take a look and then you can proceed um, is, is, is hard. Yeah. So on the opposite spectrum, what do you find most inspiring about archeology span or having a career in archeology? span um, the, the thrill of discovery is, is still there. Uh, that was a driver early on and, it, and it's still fun. Uh, uh, I've been teaching field schools pretty regularly and uh, the, the excitement that the students show when they get to find something as mundane as a small animal bone or a, a chipstone tool. And we start talking about that no one has touched that for a thousand years or 5,000 years or whatever the time period might be. Uh, just being able to put that into a context and, and maybe understand a little bit of its story is, is very exciting. So that I, I love uh, working with students, uh, particularly in the field schools and, and reliving that over and over again is, is definitely a, a, a fun part of it. And, and, and the preservation story, you know, we do have successes, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, not everything gets trashed by bulldozers. We do have some places that we have preserved successfully. And probably the best of those are the ones when we've been able to work with uh, an indigenous group that has a concern and we can help them and be a voice for them and uh, achieve an outcome that they're satisfied with too is, is, is very, very rewarding. Yeah. Uh, so you're not originally from Iowa, but what are some of your favorite places in Iowa that you've come to know through archaeology? Oh my gosh, there's a lot. Um, uh, I don't think I have an absolute favorite. I think it's, it's every part of the state. There's, there's, uh, there's cool stuff to discover and and enjoy. Um, I'm not a native Iowan. My, my wife is, and uh, um, one of our children was uh, born here, so he's a native, but um, my wife's family actually goes back uh, six or seven generations in Clayton County, so we have some pretty deep roots in northeast Iowa and uh, have explored a lot of areas up there, and of course, Effigy Mounds is a, a focal point that can't be beat, but there's lots of other smaller places uh, Brushy Creek State Park is a is a really cool little state park. Um, uh, Backbone, of course, has has uh, some places to explore, caves and whatnot. Uh, but other parts, I love the northwest part of the state. That's why I do a lot of the field school teaching out of uh, Lakeside Lab on West Okaboji. Uh, that landscape is is really different than eastern Iowa, and a lot of fun to to do archaeology in. So that's that's pretty fascinating. But uh, you know, you go down the Glenwood area and then you're into another another zone that just is remarkable. So um, lots and lots of places uh, around the state. And yeah, just to remind everybody, you do do um, field work with students and the community in the Okaboji region every single year. And that's open to anybody. To yes, that's true. Enroll that's true. In. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We have some it's a the, the basic program is four weeks and is designed more for the typical university student trying to uh, fulfill a field school requirement, but we do have one and two week uh, versions of the course that adult learners have taken and um, makes it more accessible for, for people that don't have as much time to spend. Yeah. So I'm not sure all of this question is going to fit on the screen, so I'll, <laughs> I'll read it all. No, it's there. Okay. So the Iowa Geological Survey maintains an online library of all the Iowa geological literature back as far as it's available. So can we read the reports of Samuel Kelvin, for example? Uh, so in geology, does OSA have a similar resource to read reports of people like Orr or Keese, for example, or are these too likely to contain sensitive information? Well, well, Matt has hit the nail on the head. So he sort of presaged the answer a little bit because he, he's aware that uh, locations of archaeological sites are considered sensitive and, and they're sensitive for two reasons. Uh, one is that landowners oftentimes do not want people trespassing on their property, trying to find locations that they may become aware of. So in order to encourage recording of sites, uh, we have to assure landowners that we don't share the information with just anybody uh, in terms of site specific location. The other concern, of course, is cultural sensitivity of, uh, for the um, descendants of those site locations. And many of those are indigenous peoples in, in, uh, in Iowa. So we are very careful to also protect site locations 
that uh, are considered culturally sensitive by our indigenous colleagues. And that uh, keeps, of course, the uh, looting of those sites uh, to a minimum. We can't eliminate it altogether, uh, but uh, we do try to control the flow of information about site location so that uh, there's a need to know basis. Um, so we always work with landowners. If they're interested in what's on their property, we, we work with them to uh, uh, try to build a stewardship mentality among those folks. Uh, if there are researchers, professionals, they meet certain standards of, of uh, professional activity, then they get access to, to information. Uh, but in terms of general public, um, we do have to filter a little bit. And so many of the reports that we do have online here, uh, and, it, and it's a very large online collection at this point in time, is site specific. So it is awkward uh, to redact that information. Oftentimes it, it renders a report almost unreadable by the time you redact the, the details. So some reports can that can be done. For example, we went to the trouble of uh, making a redacted version of a report that Cindy Peterson did on the Sand Road corridor south of Iowa City, uh, where she did a very detailed historical and archaeological overview. And we've had uh, a number of requests from the public for that, and we're happy to provide that if anybody wants it, um, because we have redacted the sensitive aspects out of it. Um, uh, and, it, and, it and there's still a lot of good information there. But many other reports, it's just not possible to do that. So it's, it's a little bit hit and miss. Uh, but there certainly is a lot published in, um, in the Annals of Iowa, the Palimpsest. Um, if you join the Ar Iowa Archaeological Society, you can get back issues of uh, the Journal of Iowa Archaeology has a lot of good information in it. Um, yeah, and those and, are available uh, for anybody to buy those, back those are available. So, yeah. so those issues are out there for people to get. And but then there the are books. Uh, also, uh, Lynn Alex's book, um, um, Iowa's Archaeological Past, and um, uh, Bill Whitaker did, uh, edited a book on Iowa forts, and um, uh, Lynn and Bill and Mary De La Garza cooperated on a guide to uh, archaeological sites, uh, which I'm not getting the title right on that, but... Um, um, the Archaeological that's available. Guide to Iowa. Iowa. Archaeological Guide to Iowa. So that one's available for the public as well. It has a lot of good information. Yeah, and I believe that both the Annals of Iowa and Palmcest are available through Shishi's website, and you can go pretty far back and read those. Mm -hmm. So what, um, I'm not going to say you're older, but you're, you know, you're, you're approaching retirement. So what advice, you're mature. So what, um, what are some challenges do you think the next generation of archaeologists are going to face? Well, unfortunately, funding is going to continue to be a, a battle. Uh, we are in an economic cycle, it seems like, where although the state reports huge surpluses, uh, the decision-making hierarchy is not necessarily to invest that back into the university system that, you know, leads down, trickle down to us. Uh, we are not separately funded as a line item. We're just part of the general education funding. So there's a lot of decision makers between the legislature and before it hits um, uh, my desk that can decide, nope, we're going to use these funds here. We're going to use those funds for this purpose. Um, and so funding is, is going to be challenging. And it's really too bad because interjecting even tens of thousands of dollars, we're not talking about huge sums when it comes to state budgets, but tens of thousands of dollars injected into programs like the repository or the site file or Elizabeth's uh, public outreach and education activities or our research drone technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Small amounts of money make a huge impact in terms of what we're able to actually accomplish. So um, right now our to get into the nitty gritty, over 95% of what we get through the general fund is dedicated already to salaries and fringe benefits. It gives us very little in the way of operating funds to do something that needs to be done. So we're very grant uh, dependent in, in that respect. And uh, we watch for all kinds of opportunities to, to bring in more money, but that money is a challenge. And um, if we had more, we could do more. So uh, it's one of those things that we just have to keep in mind that we have to scale our efforts to what to what we can do well and, and continue to pursue that. Other challenges are, um, uh, I think, uh, on a broader societal scale of, again, the interests that uh, our society has in issues about preservation, uh, whether it be uh, preservation of cultural resources or of natural resources. And the whole climate change issue 
uh, affects archaeology too, because we're tied into many of the federal regulations that uh, direct agencies to take into account uh, their their actions from a from a natural and cultural resource standpoint. So, as the federal ebb and flow goes on regulations, uh, so goes archaeology, um, and uh, even at the state level, there's there's challenges where there are folks who would like to develop projects, needed infrastructure, but don't always take the time to consider the impacts. And, and that's going to always be a challenge as well. Yeah. So what are some of your goals for the next five years? Well, uh, I'd like to continue expanding uh, our success at recording archaeological information before it disappears. So uh, going back to the idea of, of, of getting the public more involved in recording sites in a quality fashion would certainly be worthwhile. Um, I would also uh, very much like to see uh, more opportunities to uh, also provide information back to the public. So if we can continue to uh, secure grant and other funding to get the word out on the good work that's being done by archaeologists, I think that would help in the long run of people appreciating what we do and appreciating the past for what it is. Um, uh, other, other goals, uh, I've have a large scale research program going on with the 13 PM seven site that I mentioned with lots of colleagues. We need to bring that to fruition in the form of a, a published book, something that uh, maybe it'll just be a digital product online, but a summary statement of the work at that site, because it's proven to be really, really interesting and a microcosm of, of Mill Creek and the development of village life on the, on the Northeastern plains, at least. So I, I want to keep pushing that and that's going to be another year or two into the future, but uh, we have a great symposium scheduled for the next Society for American Archaeology meeting that will get us jump started, and hopefully we can roll that into book yeah. chapters and, and a publication. And so, that project was also one that advocational ar archaeologists were, were critical in yes. assisting with. In particular, yes, both in terms of initial reporting of this, uh, what was a, a natural disaster, this flood at the site, but then also helping us to salvage information in a, in a structured way, not just a grab bag pickup, but helping us actually record archaeological information in a way that's useful. Okay, so we got another question in and we'll, we'll definitely have to wrap this up in the next like less than 10 minutes. But um, okay. yeah, if there's more quick questions, go ahead and put them in. Um, so does OSA have an interest in a private collection of its donated mostly from Iowa and Idaho? If so, who do you contact? Okay, well, my, certainly the office here, and, and that could be me. Uh, you could directly uh, contact me. And our we're pretty uh, transparent on the OSA website. I don't know if you want to throw that into the chat, Elizabeth, but um, if you go to the OSA uh, website page on the University of Iowa, uh, we have uh, lots of contact numbers and stuff. Uh, Carrie Paris is the research collections director. You could contact her as well, or or literally any staff member will filter it to to one of us and and we can proceed from there. Uh, this is along with inquiries about artifacts. This is something that I get uh, relatively frequently, probably uh, once every couple of weeks or once a month. Uh, and it really depends, the interest level really depends on whether there's documentation with the artifacts about context, about provenience, about where was it discovered, when, who, where questions. If those can be answered with some precision, then there is research value to the collection. If it's a bucket of rocks from 14 different counties, no idea what came from where, or some from Iowa, some from Idaho, and I'm not sure which piece was which, um, it has less value. And uh, they become interesting rocks um, and not so much uh, things that we can put into the repository. Uh, but definitely contact the office and we'll get into those discussions. We've oftentimes visited with someone, taken a look at what they have, both in terms of artifacts and associated records and then, you know, made an assessment and a decision as to whether it's appropriate. Uh, don't do what one fellow did. He took a one of those big five gallon water jugs that you put on like a water cooler. And he just every time he found an artifact, he put it in there. No record whatsoever of where it came from. He collected from all over the place. And when it was full, he brought it in and wanted to give it to us. And uh, I said, wow, that's really cool. And I could see that there were interesting artifacts in it. But without any connection to anything other than, well, it's from Eastern Iowa. I said, you know, thanks, but you're gonna have to take it home with you. And he was devastated. He had no idea uh, that what he had been doing was actually destructive. Um, 
and uh, uh, and not helping in terms of a stewardship. So we have to continue to get the word out on that. that that's on us. Right. And sometimes we can use unprevenient artifacts in, in our teaching activities and outreach, but we have a huge collection of that stuff as well that's been unprevenienced. So we'll do one final question. This okay. is from Katina Lilio. So what, what should you do or what should somebody do if you see artifacts for sale at a store? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, you, you could start a conversation with uh, you know, the person at the store, if it turns out to be just a clerk who doesn't know anything about them, that won't go very far. If you can get to an owner or somebody who maybe was part of uh, the acquisition of those for the store, you might be able to explore ideas about uh, where they came from and if there's any associated information uh, uh, in terms of, of provenience or context. Um, uh, I, my experience is you're gonna run into a lot of dead ends pretty quick. Um, if it's if it's just arrowheads, uh, unfortunately, the the law of the land, at least in Iowa, is that if it came off of private property and was legally collected, that is, someone got landowner permission to collect those artifacts, they're saleable items. Uh, the only restriction would be uh, human remains, actual human bone, or things that appear to have come from a funerary context. And of course, once you remove something from the ground from its associations, that can be very hard to prove. But uh, certainly things like catlinite pipes and uh, some of the uh, certain types of small pots that are oftentimes uh, uh, still intact and whole, uh, you know, signal that uh, maybe this came from a special context and, and such. And if you saw those kind of materials, and certainly if you saw human remains, um, then letting me know, uh, sometimes we can follow up and, and find out a little bit more, but oftentimes it's a, it's an unfortunate dead end. Yeah. And as you know, they say the powers with the consumers, like personally, yeah. I wouldn't buy that object. And there right. are also lots of fakes out there. Oh, um, right. many people might've heard of the, the fakes at the, the Hoover museum that they, uh, Bjorn Anderson from the University of Iowa and a student um, realized these objects were fake on display. Um, and one last question before we wrap this up, because we do have um, to turn over the computers to somebody else. Oh, right. But are artifacts stored at the office um, of the Office of the State Archaeologist available to be viewed? Yes, we are a repository. First and foremost, we are not a museum, so we don't have a lot of space to put things out on display. But we do have some limited displays that are you know, ready to go walk in and you, can, and you can look at things. If you have an interest in a particular type of artifact, time period or site, then I recommend making an appointment with uh, Carrie, Carrie Paris, the research collection director, because there might be some lead time needed to pull a particular collection to get it out. And, and have it available. So a walk-in that might be a little more difficult for, but uh, uh, but yes, they, uh, generally yes. And I would say most of our, uh, the coolest stuff that uh, technically is um, curated by OSA is on loan at museums and nature centers all across the state. So Iowa Hall at the McBride, McBride Hall, um, the University of Iowa Museum of Natural History has a huge collection of, of artifacts, especially from the Keys collection. So you could see them there. Uh -huh. Um, Sioux City the, Public Museum has a bunch of our stuff. Yep, um, the Prairie Heritage Center in O'Brien County. Swiss and, Valley Nature Center in Dubuque has some of ours. And I'm just going to pop a link in that has places uh, where the public can go visit archaeological sites in Iowa and see archaeological objects on display. And a lot of those museums, the, the materials are on loan or partially on loan from OSA. So we're going to have to end this now. So I want to thank John for um, participating in this Q&A, for, for being brave enough to guinea pig with me to, uh, you know, experiment with this, this new technology of live streaming and everything. Um, we hope to have potentially some virtual brown bag papers this winter. So stay tuned to our um, Facebook feed for announcements on more programs. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for having me.